Your foot will grow back if you just leave it alone. Should I gouge out an eyeball next? <laughs> Rants is back, baby. You have no idea how much fun I've been having with these games so far, and I know the games haven't even started getting really good yet. Rance is a character who's just so absurd, and the world around him seems to bend and twist to accommodate him in a way that works way better than it has any right to. I've already covered the remakes of the first two Rance games, but today we're going back to the 90s and looking at Rance 3, The Fall of Lesus. If at any point you think I'm doing a good job, please consider leaving a like to help me out in the algorithm and subscribe for more content. Also, check out Twitter and Discord, and consider joining my Patreon for early access to future content. And before I move on, huge thank you to my friend Sean over at Vacant Skull Archives for lending his voice to this video. I've been wanting to collaborate with him for quite a while now, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity. His channel is linked below, so please do check him out after the video. Alright, enough of that. So like in the previous Rance videos, I have to give a few disclaimers. Firstly, Rance is a series that features adult encounters of the non-willing variety. If that's something that's going to upset you, this may not be the video for you. Also, due to the fact that repeated use of the word for these encounters can raise red flags on YouTube's end, I'll instead be referring to them as a struggle snuggle. Alright, let's get into it. So for the last two Rance videos, I specifically covered the remakes rather than the originals. And in those videos, I stated that it was because I wanted a more modern experience both for my personal enjoyment and for a better viewing experience for you all. But that was only part of the reason. Another reason I wanted to do the remakes was because when the original Rance games were remade, they changed up some stuff. It was the same basic plot, but they altered story details, added some stuff, made certain characters more important, and even changed up Rance's characterization a bit. And interestingly, the later Rance games actually line up more with the remakes than the original, both in terms of plot and characters. So it's generally agreed that the original Rance games are actually a separate timeline, capping off with the spin-off game Kichikuo Rance, and that the remakes are actually the current canon of the series. So why then am I playing Rance 3, the original, instead of Rance 03? Rance 03 is by all accounts a phenomenal game, and from what I hear, it's a better remake than the first two. There's only one issue. I can't read weeb. Yep, the game is untranslated and there are currently no active efforts to translate it, or at least none that have been publicly announced. I do think it'll eventually get translated, but there's a good chance that's years away and I do not intend to learn Japanese anytime soon. So instead, I'm playing the original. While there may be some minor inconsistencies with the remake canon, the broader plot is still close enough that it should be fine. And I will check out O3 if and when it gets an English release. It's also worth noting that if you want to play this game, it is available for free. Yes, while the game was originally a commercial release and the 01, 02, and untranslated 03 remakes are also paid products, the developers Alisoft are absolutely based. A while back, they made pretty much their entire lineup of retro titles available for free, including the early Rance games. So if you watched my previous Rance videos but were hesitant to drop money on 01 and 02, definitely consider checking this one out and maybe even the original 1 and 2, though they have not aged very well. I'd leave a link, but YouTube doesn't exactly like it when creators send their viewers to adult websites. Sites. Just search it for yourself. Alright, now let's finally get into the game. What a gutless old man! Closing shop just because he died. Before I talk about gameplay, I do want to go over how the game looks. See, Rance 3 was originally made for the PC-98, which were the main computer in Japan before Windows began world domination. Now, I haven't played very many PC-98 titles myself, mostly just the early Toho games and, of course, Rance 3. But one thing I've noticed from the games I've played and from screenshots and videos I've seen floating around is that PC-98 titles have a very distinctive aesthetic that's like a blend of pixel art and more modern sprites. It's really hard to describe, but you just don't see anything quite like it. Sort of how you can almost always identify games from retro consoles like the NES, SNES, or PS1 just based on how they look. And for what it's worth, I think that Rance 3 looks pretty damn good most of the time. The only real complaint I have is that sometimes they just fucked up the shape of the characters' heads. Like, some of them low-key look like the big brain Wojak. Aside from that, it's worth noting that the original Rance games contain mosaic censorship compared to the ones localized by Manga Gamer, which are fully uncensored outside of Japan. One of the interesting things about Rance as a series is that each game has completely different gameplay from all the others, which is something you don't really see all that often. Rance 01 had the chip combat system and the semi-linear dungeon exploration. Rance 02 was an old-school dungeon crawler. And Rance 3 is essentially a simple tactical RPG with dungeon crawling. The combat in this game is party-based, and you'll have Rance, Sill, and up to six others in your party during combat. Like Rance 02, you only have control over Rance, while your allies are controlled by the AI. The AI itself is incredibly simple. 
99% of the time, your allies will simply attack the closest enemy. Healers will heal injured party members, and spellcasters will randomly choose from their available spells, which generally either fall under the category of high damage single target or low damage but hits every enemy. You, of course, can move and attack like everyone else, though you have three levels of attacks. Light attack, normal attack, and rance attack. Each attack comes with a stamina cost. The heavier the attack, the more stamina required. If you try to do an attack with too little stamina, you'll instead rest, restoring stamina. You'll also have a few other commands. You can use any of your battle items or medicine. You can order your allies to collectively stop taking any actions whatsoever. And because this is Rance, there's an assault option. This will let you collect a dirty CG from the female monster enemies known as Galmons and from many of the female bosses you'll encounter. This will fail if the enemy's health is not low enough, and upon a successful assault, the monster will be defeated and Rance's stamina will drop to zero. It's also worth noting that enemies who are defeated via assault do not drop money or experience. One feature that's actually quite nice is the auto battle option, which is given as an option at the start of every battle and you can also turn it on mid-battle. This will simply give Rance the same AI as the party, meaning he'll charge into battle and attack the nearest enemy. Very handy for clearing out trash mobs, especially later in the game when you come across large groups of enemies or really tanky enemies. It just streamlines the process so you don't have to hit the same commands turn after turn after turn. Once you enter battle, the goal is simply to eliminate all the enemies. Your allies can be knocked out and will have to be healed outside of battle if you want to use them again. However, if Rance is killed, it's game over. Think of it like a game of chess where Rance is the king. One strategy I used when I didn't feel like manually playing out the fights but wasn't confident in survival was to spend a turn or two letting my party advance and then turn on auto battle. This basically let my party act as meat shields which more or less ensured that Rance would rarely be targeted at all. One downside to the combat system, which is incredibly unlikely to negatively affect any of you watching, is that due to its simplicity, it's actually kind of boring to look at and watch. Because of this, I actually stopped recording footage about a third of the way through the game to save on disk space. I'd been taking regular screenshots anyway and continued to do so, but really I think it's more visually appealing to see the various portraits and CGs in the game as opposed to the same simplistic gameplay loop. And I took over 90 screenshots, so I'll mostly be showing you those for the video. Early on you'll get an item that lets you summon an additional combatant. I won't say who it is until later because I want to hold off on spoilers until I start talking story. But this character is super fucking powerful. Hits like a truck, is super tanky, has a stamina cap so high that it's for all intents and purposes infinite, and due to not being a normal party member, she will always start fully healed. Her only real downside is that she can't level up, though to be fair, she'll be the most powerful party member throughout the whole game regardless, and also when summoning her, it will not only consume Rance's turn, but will drain his stamina to zero. That being said, this downside is mitigated by an item you can get pretty early that will auto-summon her at the start of combat with no penalty. The combat map itself is very, very simple. In fact, there's literally nothing there aside from the party and the enemies. The only factors that significantly affect each fight are what enemies show up and the random placement of both your party and the enemies. And furthermore, since your allies are completely AI driven, that saps a lot of the strategic depth from the game. Most of the time, if I wasn't just letting auto battle do its thing, my plan was to try to position myself so that the enemies wouldn't be targeting Rance so that I wouldn't risk a game over. From there, I'd basically just attack whoever the party was ganging up on to try to whittle down the enemy one by one. So the game really didn't get the brain juices flowing at all. Which is a bit of a shame because I think the format had a lot of potential that simply wasn't realized. I stared hotly at Rolla's naked body stretched out in front of me. <laughs> this is so stupid. Now one thing I absolutely have to talk about is the difficulty scaling and the level up system. But first, I'm going to give you a little behind the scenes info about these videos. On a personal level, I usually prefer to go into my games blind or close to it. However, when I'm playing a game specifically for the channel, I always do a bit of preliminary research so that my playtime and thought process are a bit more efficient. Basically, if there are certain gameplay related things to look out for or missable content, I'd like to know about it so I can be as thorough as possible in my analysis. I just don't usually mention it in my videos because I feel it would kind of distract from the point. Now the reason I'm talking about this now is because Rance 3 handles its overall difficulty in such a way that is very unusual but I would not have noticed it if I hadn't done research. See, after every combat you gain gold and everyone who participated gains experience. When camping you can call the level goddess Willis who will level up anyone who has accumulated enough experience. Interestingly, the experience system actually has an inverse scaling with Rance's level, meaning the lower his level, the more experience the party gains, and vice versa. Additionally, the majority of the game can actually be completed fairly easily at level 10, which is where you start out. 
So you're actually encouraged to not level up until you absolutely have to so that you can be as leveled up as possible for the end game, which admittedly does stat check you pretty hard. This is very odd to me, and while I don't hate the idea conceptually, I do wish it was communicated somewhere in game. Also, the game does feel like it had a very inconsistent difficulty overall, particularly as you start to accumulate party members. I mean, once Shizuka joins you, her multi-target attacks can clear out enemies like crazy. That really powerful summon I mentioned earlier not only smacks the enemies down, but can soak up a lot of damage. But at the same time, certain dungeons are much more likely to knock out party members or even rants while the next dungeon becomes easy again. When you first start to encounter mimics, there's a good chance you won't be able to kill them and will have to run instead. And then the second to last boss, as I mentioned, straight up stat checks you. For reference, I got to that section at level 18 and I honestly think I over leveled a bit. There was just one section where the enemies were hitting pretty hard and I wanted to get through it a little easier. So I used up all my experience right before the fight and I got to level 43. I still failed the first attempt and needed to use stamina restoration and healing items to finally get the kill. It's fucking ridiculous. And I think that's actually the biggest weakness of Rance 3 on a gameplay level. The individual elements all work, but the balance is absolutely dog shit, and I think that's a bit of a shame. Pivoting away from combat a bit, the exploration works a lot like a retro dungeon crawler or a more standard JRPG with the game mostly comprised of various dungeons to explore. I don't have too much to say about them, but I do believe that the layouts had more of a sense of purpose than in Rance 02, where there was an overall flow to the dungeon. You go down one path to get one thing, and another path for another thing. In Rance 02, there was a lot of retreading the same ground, scouring areas, and bashing your head against the wall. I'm not going to say that there was none of that in Rance 3, but since the exploration was spread out over more than only four dungeons, the game had more than enough real estate to keep everything fresh. There were a few instances where some of the dungeons were just annoying. I think the best example of this is the Hyper Tower, which has several dozen floors. Most of your travel will just be going up the stairs a bunch of times because most of these floors have nothing in them, but a few seemingly arbitrary ones do have something like a treasure chest, and it's one of those cases where I'd recommend a guide for that section. Not because the dungeon overall is particularly difficult, but because you'll probably miss things because you didn't know that this particular floor is something you're going to want. But still, it's overall a massive improvement over O2, so I really can't complain too much. I always like to say that even if a game has issues, I can always appreciate forward motion. One way that Rance 3 really did step it up was by effectively filling the game with collectibles. Now, one thing that a lot of visual novels and visual novel adjacent games will do is have a bunch of unlockable CGs, and games specifically will often make these a reward structure and a completion marker. Rance 3 really expanded on that. While it doesn't have a standard gallery like most modern titles do, you can access all the CGs in game. And there are actually quite a lot of optional ones that function as collectibles. As mentioned earlier, a lot of the enemies you come across can be assaulted for an unlock. Through exploration, you'll come across rare rare stones, which are basically the Rance Universe's version of VHS tapes with porn on them, which as you can imagine, unlocks another CG. There are a couple of side quests you can do where the primary reward is another CG or a set of CGs. And lastly, there are two instances where you have to collect a set of four mirror fragments to get a CG. Now this is where I got more than a little frustrated. See, I actually like all these optional completion criteria, and I do appreciate that the game rewards you with art for doing things. But I do have two issues. Firstly, almost every dungeon is a one and done kind of deal. Once you beat it, you can't go back. So if there's a certain Galmon in there that you haven't assaulted, you've got to get that CG or miss out permanently. My other issue is with the mirror fragments. Basically, the enemies you fight can randomly drop chests which will contain an item or will turn into a mimic which is a tough fight but rewards a lot of gold and experience. Well, in the areas where there are mirror fragments to collect, they're pretty fucking rare and unless you get very lucky, you're going to have to do quite a bit of grinding to get that CG and it's not very fun at all. I grinded out the first one and it took me probably a half hour to 45 minutes of just finishing fight after fight after fight with auto battle. Got me a lot of experience and enough gold to completely clean out the available shops, but it was an absolute pain. And was it worth it? Not really. The CG was nice and I got a few funny lines of dialogue out of it, but it was not reflective of the time that I had put into it. The second set of fragments are in the last area of the game, which is sectioned off from the rest of the game and contains several dungeons that you'll be going between. Now, I fought every single random battle in this very long section of gameplay. Like, the area contains a lot of story and gameplay. I ended up getting two fragments after dozens and dozens of combats. I didn't really want to grind out the rest of them, especially since I was so close to finishing the game. So I didn't. Honestly, I think this was a decent idea, but it was implemented poorly, and it goes back to my earlier criticism that the game itself had some pretty severe balancing issues. Now I want to talk about money. As the battles are pretty easy to deal with through automation most of the time, gold is actually quite plentiful, and chances are you'll be fully kitted out for most of your time playing. 
However, there's one nice little addition that I think makes the gold system actually serve a use. There's an item you can get in one of the shops that costs a hefty 10,000 gold each that'll allow you to automatically get an enemy's assault CG without having to do the whole weaken an assault thing like you're throwing a fucking Pokeball at a Mewtwo. This results in gold being actually worth something beyond just gear upgrades, and it especially makes it not a complete waste to grind out the various collectibles like the Galmons in earlier dungeons, where you'll likely get a bunch of combat victories from hunting the Galmons in the first place and from the inevitable accidental kills. That'll pump up your gold, but you'll have a great use for it once you unlock that particular shop. The only downside is that this item is no longer purchasable once you start the final section of the game, despite there actually being an item shop there. So unfortunately, you'll have to either save up gold to buy these items beforehand, or just get the last group of enemy CGs the old-fashioned way. But overall, I felt that the economy of Rance 3 was the best so far. And lastly, I'll briefly discuss how things are in towns, but it's honestly so simple and so similar to the previous games that I don't really want to go in-depth. When you're in a town, you can move to any of the significant locations, such as a shop or certain story areas. When you're in one of these locations, you'll have the look, talk, and ask options where you can interact with the various people you find, and the story progresses through various triggers found within these dialogue options. It's pretty simple stuff, it works, and it's nice to see that things have been getting progressively less convoluted as the time goes on. So on a gameplay level, I do feel like Rance 3 is the best of the first three retro games in the series. I do prefer the combat and exploration in Rance 01, but the original 1989 game wasn't great in my opinion, so compared to its predecessors, Rance 3 is a major step up. Despite a few frustrations, I genuinely enjoyed my time playing this game. If I pass up a chance to screw this fine woman, it'll be a black mark on the reputation of the genius Rance Summer. It's only right that I should screw her silly. So now it's time to add a nice little bit of spice to the video. Fuckers. And by that, I mean it's time for some story talk. So back in my other Rance videos, I talked about how Rance as a series has some great detailed lore. However, the first two games didn't really have all that much going on in that regard. They really acted more like isolated stories that were fun, but didn't really affect all that much in terms of how the story progresses moving forward. Rance 3 is where that starts to change. Although to be perfectly fair, I would guess it's more or less a transitional stage story-wise. The events of Rance 3 are starting to have effects on the world as a whole, characters are starting to be introduced, side characters from previous games are starting to have a lot more importance, and Rance is growing in his own influence. Like, the story hasn't hit its full swing yet, but it's definitely starting to pick up. So I think it goes without saying that there will be spoilers up ahead. You have been warned. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the fact that the writing of Rance 3 has some stylistic differences compared to the remakes. I can't say for sure, but I guess the reasoning for this is a combination of different translation teams working on the early games compared to the later games, and the fact that writing styles naturally change over time anyway. One of the things I noticed immediately was that Rance 3 uses Japanese honorifics while the remakes do not. Now, the honorifics were almost certainly in the original Japanese for the remakes, but when it comes to localization, the inclusion or exclusion of these honorifics often comes down to a stylistic decision on the part of the localization team. Personally, I think that titles with a more eastern setting are generally better off keeping the honorifics. I mean, when I see a story set in Japan that does not include them, it just feels off. However, more westernized settings fit better without them because it can lead to a bit of unwanted dissonance. When it comes to Rance, there's actually a mix of both eastern and western influences in its setting. The actual location is essentially a fictionalized version of East Asia, and there are plenty of traditionally East Asian cultural markers and foods within this world. However, it's also a high fantasy setting, clearly taking inspiration from traditional European folk fantasy, with a very knights and heroes kind of feel to it. So which is better? Honestly, I think they both work, and it's hard to say which I prefer. What I will say is there's one lovely bit of characterization they do with the honorifics, and that's that Rance will often introduce and refer to himself as Rance-sama, which if you know anything about Japanese honorifics, you know that's cocky as fuck. There are other instances of the writing style changing from the originals to the remakes, but I thought that was the most striking. There's also the fact that back when the original Rance games were made, Japanese censorship laws were more strict than they are today, so a lot of vulgar sexual words were actually replaced with X's, which is a little jarring, but you get used to it. I've also been informed that this is actually the reason Rance refers to his dick by a bunch of funny nicknames like Ultimate Hyperweapon or Hammer of Justice. They just decided to keep it even after they didn't have to censor the more descriptive words because they thought it was funny. So the last big difference I want to talk about is Rance himself. Now don't get me wrong, he's actually very similar in both the originals and remakes, more similar than I was led to believe actually. He's still a horny, arrogant piece of shit. He's still reckless and a dumbass. He's still funny as fuck. 
However, I noticed that in the original, he's a bit more cruel, more prone to fits of rage, and a little more sadistic in general. For example, he straight up murders a shop owner because someone stole the things he wanted to buy. That's something that I feel would be out of character in the remake canon. Of course, he's still more than willing to commit murder, but it would be out of a warped sense of justice or because he felt it would achieve some kind of end as opposed to an outburst of emotion. But it's worth noting that the two versions of Rance are similar enough that I don't feel a disconnect in the series as a whole. Even though I can't understand the Japanese-only O3 and know I'm not going to use a machine translation, Rance 3 still feels like a cohesive continuation of the story after O1 and O2. So earlier in the video, I talked about how Rance 3 is where the story finally starts to pick up and develop into what I'm sure will be a long series of plot lines moving forward. I'm Rance, the hero of love and justice. I can't overlook your evil girl. I'll reform you with my hot dick of justice. Prepare yourself. <laughs> So I'm going to quickly go over the plot, though like the last two Rance videos, I'm not going to harp on each individual plot point since I don't think it actually matters all that much. The story starts out with Rance and Syl at home sometime after the events of the second game. If you remember, Rance was paid a fortune for saving the town of Cathom, but let's be real here. Rance isn't exactly the type of person to live a modest lifestyle, so he basically pissed it all away and instead of finding more work, he's basically just been selling all his shit in the meantime. So he was basically broke and there's also a funny bit where it's revealed that he lost all of his levels from the previous game because of how lazy he's been. Like he complains that he was at least level 40 but he's now down to level 10. I found it funny. But basically, as Rance is just about to be forced to finally go out and get more work, he runs into Konami. Konami is the ninja from the first game who would kidnap girls for Princess Leia's torture chamber. She was sent by Princess Leia, now Queen Leia, to Rance and she proceeds to explain the central conflict of the game. Lesus had been invaded by the neighboring nation of Hellman who were able to completely overwhelm Lesus with their superior military and the assistance of Noche, a supernatural entity known as a Dark Lord, eventually taking Castle Lesus. Now the Dark Lords were very powerful but typically didn't pose much of a threat due to the fact that most of their attention was spent feuding with each other for power. The fact that one was involved in this conflict was concerning. So Leah ordered Konami to escape and bring the Holy Shield to Rance, who she still believed is destined to rule the kingdom by her side. So basically, the Holy Shield, along with the Holy Sword and Holy Armor that she gave him in the last game, are the three components needed to access the sword Chaos, which is one of the few weapons that can kill a Dark Lord. Rance was to be the hero to wield it. Rance agrees to help liberate Lesus on two conditions. Firstly, he wanted a sizable portion of Lesus' budget as payment. Secondly, Come on, you fucking know what he wanted. He wanted to fuck the shit out of Konami. She's obviously not thrilled about this proposition, but agrees since she's got no other choice. So now, all they need to do is infiltrate the castle, use the holy armaments, and obtain chaos. Just one tiny little problem. Rance sold the holy sword and armor to the local weapon shop and he doesn't have the money to buy them back. So Rance finally needs to go back to the Adventurer's Guild to get another job. Eventually, he gets a rescue mission. A girl named Rolla went missing and is believed to be held captive in Lys's cave. Fast forwarding a bit and it turns out that Liss is a monster and he and Rolla are in a relationship. Rance and co kick Liss's ass and Rance then proceeds to aggressively struggle snuggle Rolla. So this poor girl is just miserable but Rance completes his job and gets the money he needs to buy back the items. However, it turns out that Rolla stole the items from the weapon shop before Rance could get to them. This was to get back at him for the struggle snuggling and for presumably killing her boyfriend. He didn't actually kill Liss, but he also neglected to correct Rolla when she made the assumption. So the next arc of the game is all about trying to hunt Rolla down and get the holy sword and holy armor back. No matter how amazing I am, I don't want to take on hundreds of people at once. <laughs> I could take on a few hundred women at once though. I'd like to use this opportunity to pivot into something I very much love that Rance 3 does, which is that for pretty much the first time, Rance's reckless actions actually have negative consequences for him. So a big facet of the Rance remakes was that all the crazy shit Rance does either has no repercussions or actually ends up working to his benefit, such as how his struggle snuggling was able to get the evil rings off the four witches since they can only be worn by virgins. Now this has its charm and it absolutely fits the tongue-in-cheek porn logic that this game series likes to lean into, but I definitely appreciate that his behavior can now get him into trouble too. A lot of the fun of a goofball protagonist, especially an anti-hero like Rance, is seeing them try to overcome obstacles of their own creation. It just leads to some great bits of comedy. And with Rance specifically, absurdist humor plays a big part of the charm of the series and the contrast of Rance actually being able to fuck things up alongside his plot armor allows for the story to be a lot more unpredictable and leads to some funny moments. So going back to the story, fast forward a bit and the group travel to the city of Kanra to hunt down Rola, though by the time they get there, she has since moved on to a city that I'm not actually sure how to pronounce. Seriously, it's got a fucking hyphen in its name. I'm just gonna call it Lazile. 
Only problem is that the city is occupied and there's a roadblock preventing entry. See where we're heading with this? Rance now has to get himself involved in the nitty gritty of the war with Hellman in order to complete his main objective, which is to recover the holy sword and armor so he can get access to chaos. Luckily, they run into the priestess Rosé from the second game who informs them of the Devil Cave, which will let them sneak into Cathom, which if you remember was where the second game took place. Cathom is currently under siege. They're holding strong, but it's only a matter of time. So when they go to the Devil Cave, guess who they find? Mother fucking Felis. She's the devil from the second game who Rance tricked and fucked, though not in that order. I was so happy to see her again because she's legitimately my favorite minor character up to this point. Turns out, Rance's stunt got her demoted to guard duty. She was angry but resigned herself to slowly working her way back up the ranks. As you might imagine, she was not happy to see Rance again. Skipping ahead a bit, with the help of Rosé and another devil, Rance is able to learn Felix's name, which he then uses to bind her to his servitude because that's how it works in this universe. If you know a devil's true name, they become your slave, but you can only have one at any given time. So now, Felix is Rance's slave, and if you were wondering, she's the super powerful party member I mentioned earlier. The group makes their way through the cave and meet up with Maria and Shizuka, two of the four witches from the previous game. They're leading the Cathom defense, and while they've been doing very well so far, they're severely outnumbered and likely can't survive another full-on attack. Around this time, the game pulls you away to show you scenes of Leah and her attendant Maris being tortured and interrogated by a female officer named Saya. No, not that Saya. And also properly introduces the main antagonist of the game, Hellman General Patton, who's going on this conquest for the clout, basically. His idea is that this show of force will ensure his rise to the throne of Hellman. And there's also Notche, the Dark Lord from earlier. His motivations are still unclear, but his involvement with the war is somehow going to help him find something that will give him an edge over the other Dark Lords. Furthermore, once Hellman and Notche both win their respecting wars, their alliance will effectively ensure that neither one's power can really ever be threatened. Okay, back to Cathom. Rance learns that the Cathom Defense Force has very few available fighters and that the Hellman army seems to be bolstered by brainwashed Lesis soldiers. So Rance comes up with a plan. Now as you can imagine, he doesn't work for free. His condition is that if he succeeds, he gets to fuck Maria, Shizuka, and Millie. Of course. So Rance's plan is to tie Maria up and bring her to the Hellman commander Henderson so he and Silk can fuck shit up from behind enemy lines and gather intel. Now this lets me pivot into another interesting thing that the story of Rance 3 does that the previous games didn't. I continue my love-filled foreplay and still as wet as a fountain in the blink of an eye. Man, I'm such a technician. For the first time, we're starting to see that Rance is actually somewhat competent once you get past his external layer of horny dumbass. Now, we'd already seen from the first two games that he's a gifted warrior. I mean, after all, he's basically a parody of the overpowered fantasy JRPG hero with plot armor. However, up until this game, he's been pretty consistently portrayed as a total dipshit making his way through these adventures due to sheer luck, with many of the obstacles he faces lining up with his depravities by chance. But in Rance 3, he actually demonstrates an ability to make calculated, intelligent decisions even though his impatient nature and general arrogance will also lead him to make foolish decisions at times. So in this instance, Rance actually comes up with a plot to use subterfuge to dismantle the Hellman attack force by taking out the commander and hopefully finding a way to free the brainwashed Legion's soldiers. It's a very fine line, but it's neat to see how Rance does actually have the potential to be a prodigious military leader, and shit. Sometimes his aggressive tactics are exactly what they need due to the shock factor of seeing them come from an underdog force. Now I know this may seem like a very minor thing to many of you watching, but when I look at any piece of writing, I appreciate the little things that go into the bigger picture. And with Rance specifically, I think those little things stand out even more to me. While the premise of Rance is incredible, that alone can't carry the series through 10 mainline games, 3 remakes, and multiple spin-offs. No matter how good the initial idea is, it needs to be backed up by strong writing in order to maintain its appeal long term. And things like this, the slow revelation of Rance's place in the world outside of just his more outrageous features do a lot to make him a protagonist that I actually want to follow for the rest of the series. And the fact that this is all happening in the third game where multiple people have informed me that it's only just starting to get good leaves me with a lot of hope for the rest of the series, and if Alisoft were able to keep it up, the story could very well reach the level of masterpiece. So yes, this one little piece of character development is small, but to me, it's not inconsequential. Look, you don't have to agree with everything I say or share my views on the games I play or the visual novels I read, but I would like you to understand my perspective and use my own analysis to spark your own train of thought and maybe to consider ideas you hadn't thought of before. Okay, I went on a bit of a tangent there, so let's get back to the plot. So Rance's plan went off near perfectly. They infiltrated the commander's residence, suffered no casualties, and eventually found a woman named Nurse who was responsible for maintaining the brainwashing spell on the Lazus soldiers. Rance then distracts her, with his dick, 
breaking her hold on the soldiers and immediately turning the tide of the siege. While the Lezen forces are still outnumbered in the grand scheme of things, they took back Lazile and are now in a position to start fighting back for real. Now here's the thing, Rance doesn't really give a shit about any of that. He's just excited that he gets to fuck. Due to a series of events that I skipped over involving an aphrodisiac, Maria had already, let's say, fulfilled her end of the bargain. So Rance expected a visit from Millie and or Shizuka that night. This did not happen and he had a long and restful night's sleep. This pissed him off and during the next day's briefing he was just incredibly pissy. It actually reminds me of back when my sister was like 14 and every minor inconvenience was this Sisyphusian burden and she would make sure you didn't fucking forget it. Like Rance really was acting like a petulant child and it was fucking hilarious. So the Liberation Force is in high spirits, Maria was almost done inventing a fucking tank and they were ready to start making moves. Rance then rage quits the army. He's upset that the deal wasn't upheld so he just fucks off and decides he'll figure shit out without the army. In any case, now that he has access to Lazile, he manages to track down Rola, but they're in a bit of a stalemate. She had hidden the sword and armor, and her hatred of Rance meant that no amount of struggle snuggling would convince her to give up the location. Even the threat of death didn't work since she no longer felt life was worth living without Liss. So Rance had to put a pin in that particular objective. He tries to get to the town of Red, but encountered another roadblock. It's around this time that he learned that the Liberation Army got their asses handed to them in battle. Without much else to do, he goes back. Earlier I mentioned that Maria was working on a tank. Well, she still needed one thing to make the finishing touch, Hirara Alloy. Only problem is that the mine has been having monster issues and even though Millie was sent to figure out what's going on, things were completely silent. So Rance offers to sort things out on two conditions. Firstly, he's to be given total command over the army. Secondly, Maria has to get Shizuka to fuck him. Now, as you can imagine, he succeeds, but that series of events isn't super important. What is important is another way the series is starting to pick up. I've already discussed how Rance's character is slowly starting to develop and how the overall stakes are starting to be raised in the world as a whole. However, we're now starting to see how Rance is increasing his own power and influence in the world and in a way that's a lot more deliberate than the first two games. From my understanding, the first two games were made before Alisoft really had a solid idea of where the series was going, so they were made without really setting things up for the future. Yes, Rance was able to, let's say, seduce the then Princess of Lysus, but that really wasn't anything more than an offhand joke at the time. In Rance 3, they retroactively used that plot point to establish Rance's connection to the kingdom's elite. But here, we're also seeing Rance establish himself in the Lysus military. He's making a legitimate name for himself in the course of history, and while I don't know a whole lot about where the series goes, I know that Rance plays an integral part in the geopolitical landscape of multiple countries as time goes on. It's very exciting to see the origins of that and to see him establish his place at least partially through his own merits. I said earlier that Rance 3 feels like a transitional piece, and that may have seemed somewhat dismissive at the time, but I didn't mean it that way. I enjoy seeing this series blossom from its more simplistic origins into this multi-installment epic, and it's the little things like Rance's growing influence that really enhances that for me. You're in the way. Go somewhere else. Like I could do something as gross as talk with a male co-worker all night. Bars, are you a, a homo? Okay, so from here, a lot of the individual plot points serve as good world building and tell an exciting story of the war, but aren't all that important in the meta sense. So I'm going to be skipping over a lot from here on out. Just play the fucking game if you want to see what I'm skipping. It's free. You have no excuse not to. So war stuff happens, and eventually Syl gets kidnapped by Satala, another Dark Lord helping the Hellman army, who actually showed up earlier in the game, but I didn't mention it at the time. She took Syl to use as a bargaining chip to get the holy armor, sword, and shield. Now, Rance does actually kind of care for Syl, just a little, and he's actually quite protective over her, basically having the mentality of, nobody can abuse her but me. In his quest to find Syl, he runs into none other than Lys, who had turned himself human in order to be with Rola. Turns out, becoming human is something you can do if you just set your mind to it. That's literally how it's explained in-game. They return to Rola, who gives up the holy armor and sword now that she has Lys back. Turns out she was hiding them under the table this whole time. They then make their way to Satala, successfully set up a trap for her which would have banished her but one of her underlings sacrificed herself to save her. Still, Satala was weakened and had to retreat, so Syl is saved and Rance now has all three of the holy armaments. Quick side note, in my last two Rance videos, one of my biggest complaints was with how much Rance and Syl were separated in those games. I maintain that these two have the best chemistry of any two characters in the series so far, and they really do steal the show. And while Rance and Syl did get separated, it was only for a short time, which is something that I said I would have been fine with in the previous games. It's not that they got separated that I cared about, it's that they spend a significant portion of the games apart. So Rance 3 kept the pair together except for one small span of time, and I appreciate it. So they go back and do more war shit, slowly gaining ground, eventually making their way to Lisa's castle. Unfortunately, the castle is extremely well defended and they couldn't fight their way in. 
Furthermore, since the castle and surrounding hamlet are pretty much self-sustaining, a siege is out of the question. Not that Ranch would have really had the patience for one anyway. So what he does is he comes up with what is basically a Trojan horse, but with a golden hanny shell. The funny thing is that while in the Iliad, Odysseus's Trojan horse plan is viewed as this stroke of military genius. In Rance 3, the general reaction is, this is fucking stupid, do you really think they're gonna fall for this? Fortunately, Patton falls for this. So Rance and company open up the gates, free Leah and Morris, and everyone proceeds to fuck shit up. Rance, Leah, and the rest make their way to finally retrieve Chaos, one of the most powerful weapons in the world, one of the few that can kill a Dark Lord, and so powerful that it's actually sentient. Unfortunately, Chaos was actually responsible for keeping the demon king Gela sealed away, and taking the sword freed her. She's still weak, so she decides to spare the group as thanks for breaking the spell. But she still harbors a bit of a grudge against the sword, so she barks an order at Noche. Now, he only knows one thing. He wants to kill Chaos. So he breaks the sword and leaves. Now here comes one of the best moments in the entire game. The sword starts talking, and it just is Rance. Just as arrogant, just as overpowered, just as much of a dumbass, and notably, just as horny. A little bit racist, though. There's a bunch of funny dialogue here, and I'd highly recommend playing the game yourself so you can read it. Zero chance I can do it justice here. But basically, even though Chaos was broken, it wasn't dead, and even better, it could be repaired. Long story short, Rance and company had to let it molest a nun they knew. So Chaos is back to normal, and the group do a bunch of stuff to fight the forces in the castle. Rance then finds Satala, beats her, molests her, and instead of banishing her, lets her go. The way this played out is almost certainly setting up a future rivalry because she tells him to make sure he doesn't get killed by anyone else. I'm happy about this because Satala is a fun character, and like Felis, I'm excited to see more of her going forward. Eventually, Rance is able to dispatch Noche with the help of the friends he made in the army, and with the help of Chaos, he even manages to defeat the Demon King in one-on-one -on -one combat. Gela claims she wants to fuck Rance because, you know, after being sealed for a thousand years, the pipes got a little bad. Up. Of course, she also asks Rance to leave Chaos and the others in the other room so they can have privacy. Rance at this point is no longer thinking with his upper head and agrees. They fuck and the Demon King opens up a portal to trap herself and Rance in the dimension of darkness. Even if she can never escape, she would still get the last laugh against Rance. Syl tries to rescue him but ends up stuck inside with him, so now they're both trapped forever, but at least they're together. Okay, but just wait a minute. This is only the third game. We can't just kill off our protagonist with seven more mainline titles to go. Well, this isn't the end of the story, but to explain what happens, I have to go over a very minor event that happened way back in the Devil Cave. I didn't discuss it then because it was such a small thing that it would've been kind of weird for me to point it out at the time. So at one point, they needed to get through a portal, but the devil guarding it refuses to let through those who are pure of heart. So he tells Rance that if he wants to prove his worth, he needs to trample on the god plate in the next room over. Such an affront to god could only be done by the truly evil. Rance, of course, still believes he's a Star Wars hero, but it's been established that he doesn't believe in God, so he doesn't care about stepping on the plate. Afterwards, the devil is all like, Dude, what the fuck? No way! I can't believe you actually did it! And lets him pass. Now, at the time, I assumed that this was just a throwaway joke. There had been many similar interactions, and it was just a funny way to show that Rance is really a piece of shit, but he still maintains his moral delusions. However, as Rance and Syl are stuck in the darkness, God himself shows up. Checkmate, atheists. He's pretty pissed about what Rance did to his plate, and he's not letting him get away with it. So he transports the pair to an unknown location, though it's assumed to be a very long distance, possibly not even on the same planet. I don't actually know since I haven't started the next game yet. So they're hopelessly lost, but they've done the impossible and escaped the darkness. The game ends with the credits and Rance's allies all dealing with Rance's disappearance and organizing a search for him. Of course, getting blue balled like this is only leaving me itching to find out what happens next, and oh man, the stakes are fucking skyrocketing now. So that was the story of Rance 3, and you've already got a decent idea of what I think. Things are really starting to move forward, and the individual elements of the world, such as the side characters, Rance himself, his place in the world, are all really starting to develop, and I can't get enough of it. Of course, even though the game started having good writing, that doesn't make it any less funny. I mean, at one point in Lisa's castle, which is basically the climax of the story, they end up in Queen Leah's bedchambers, and you can find a life-size Rance doll that she sleeps with. Basically a husbando body pillow. It's just such a stupid thing that still makes sense when you consider Leah's behavior up to this point. 
and it's made even better by still just going, I want one. Stupid shit like that is present throughout the game, and while I do harp on about all the good the game did in terms of its world and setting up a future story with quality writing, comedy and absurdity is the heart and soul of Rance and it can't be ignored. The game is fucking funny, and even if you're not a nerd like me who enjoys digging into the little things when it comes to writing, Rance 3 is still a fun time all around. Honestly, I was pleasantly surprised at how much I enjoyed the story content of Rance 3, especially considering all the praise I've seen for the remake. So overall, Rance 3 was great. I do have my gripes about the gameplay, but the story is everything I could possibly want from the game, especially given the time period it was released, when game stories weren't exactly the most developed medium. And even though I do think that the gameplay hasn't aged amazingly, it's still a big step up from O2 and the original Rants, though I maintain that O1 is still more fun in that regard. This is a game that I believe is a great launchpad for the series as a whole, and I am now more excited to play Rants 4 than I have been for any of the games so far. I want to see what happens, I want to see how they'll switch up the gameplay, I want to see what clever and fun things the writers came up with. I had such a good time with Rants 3, and I absolutely can't wait to get started on the next one. Thanks for watching. Huge thank you once again to my friend Sean over at Vacant Skull Archives for lending his voice to this video. The man is criminally underrated. I'll link to his channel down below. Please do check him out. If you like what I do, there's a good chance you'll like what he does. Also, thank you to my patrons, especially my god tier supporters Spawn, Bulk Squat Thrust, and Michael Rotolo. Consider checking out my Patreon page to join them and gain early access to future videos. Follow me on Twitter at AdsTweets for dumb jokes and to find out what I'm working on at any given time. Join the Discord server for some fun times. I got a lot of good stuff in the pipeline that I can't wait to get started with. Not just rants, not just my secret project. Also, I've recently noticed that I have just around 20 hours of edited content on my channel. I think I want to try to get that up to a full day by the end of the year. That's four hours of content, including this video, over two and a half months. Let's fucking do it. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Yeah! Girls should be treasured. I'm a feminist, you know.